Hello. In this lecture, we'll begin our study of logarithmic functions. Specifically, we'll define logarithmic functions, evaluate some examples, and see how they can be used to cancel exponential functions. We'll look at graphs of logarithms, including their domain and range, the standard sort of shape that the graph takes, and what their vertical asymptote is. Finally, we'll introduce some logarithmic identities that correspond to some exponential identities. So remember, We've already introduced the notion of an invertible function. A function is invertible if there is a function that we call f inverse of x. Remember that is not one over f of x. It's not the best notation, but it's what we use. We call this the inverse function, f inverse of x, such that the composition f of f inverse of x will always produce x. So whatever you plug into the composition f of f inverse, you get exactly that out but also the other order. If you plug any x into f and then plug that result into f inverse, you end up with the number you started with. Then as we've said, f inverse is called the inverse function of f, and the idea is that they undo one another. From the identities above, note that whatever number x you plug in, if you plug it into f inverse and then take that result and plug it into f, you end up where you started, or the other way around. So whatever f does to a number, f inverse sends it back to the original, and whatever f inverse does to a number, f sends it back to the original. So they undo one another. That's the idea. Now a function is invertible if it is one to one. In terms of the graph of the function, this means it must pass the horizontal line test. Any given y value or horizontal line must intersect the graph only once. Possibly not at all, but definitely not more than once. So anything that is in the range is only in the range once. Also remember, if we pick a number b which is larger than 1 and try to graph the exponential function b to the x, the graph will look basically like this. It will go through the point 0, 1, it will go to up to the right, and it will flatten out to the left. Now this does pass the horizontal line test. If you pick any horizontal line for a positive value of y, it will intersect the graph exactly once. If you pick a value of y to be 0 or less, it will never intersect the graph at all. So every horizontal line either intersects the graph once or not at all, it does pass the horizontal line test. Now if b is in between 0 and 1, you simply get a reflection across the y-axis, a horizontal reflection, so it will still pass the horizontal line test. If b is exactly equal to 1, the graph will be a horizontal line, which will intersect that horizontal line infinitely many times. So for b equals 1, we are definitely not 1 to 1. For b larger than 1, we have the pictured graph, which is 1 to 1, and for b less than 1 but still positive, we're simply a reflection of this, which is still 1 to 1. So since this is a 1 to 1 function, what it means is that if you get out the same thing twice, if plugging in two different values for your exponent gives you the same overall value, then the inputs must have been the same. Because the output is the same, because we have a fixed value of y that we got out twice, that's supposed to be a horizontal line, bear with me, the only input that corresponds to that y value, it, it's unique, there's just one of them. So if you got out the same thing twice, you actually plugged in the same thing. If b to the x is equal to b to the y, then x must equal y. This is really what it means to be one to one. Which means that this function is invertible. One-to-one -one functions can be abstractly inverted. So let's define a function to just be the inverse of exponentiation with base b, where b is larger than 1. And again, this also works where b is less than 1 but positive, but all of our pictures are just going to be where b is larger than 1. We call this inverse function the logarithm with base b. So log base b of x is by definition the inverse function of b to the x. Now this b, in terms of notation, is a subscript. It's not multiplying the x. You don't have an exponential here of b to the x. Logarithm base b is the function. x is the input. So because they're inverse functions, by definition, they undo one another. If you take the logarithm function of base b and use it as the input to the exponential function of base b, you'll simply get out the x that you plugged into your logarithm. Whereas if you plug an x into the exponential of base b and plug that into your logarithm of base b, they will undo each other and return exactly the x that you started with. This is simply by definition of what logarithms are. They are the inverse functions of exponentials of the same base. So how do we think about the logarithm of base b? Log base b of x, you should think of as 
the power to which the number b must be raised to give x as an output. So 2 to something will equal 100. Remember that the range of an exponential function where the base is positive and not equal to 1 will be all positive real numbers. 100 is a positive real number. So 2 to some power must equal 100. And we are defining the something to be what we call log base 2 of 100. It is the power to which 2 must be raised to produce an output of 100, which if you plug into a calculator is about 6.64. So therefore, 2 to the log base 2 of 100, 6.64 something, is exactly equal to 100, but if you simply plugged in this decimal approximation, you would be pretty close. Okay. So 3 to the y is equal to 10. What must y equal? Again, 3 to the something is an exponential function whose base is bigger than 1, so its range is all positive real numbers. 10 is a positive real number, which means there must be a number y so that 3 to the y equals 10. And we have just defined how to name this number. The number is now named log base 3 of 10. It is the number to which 3 must be raised to produce 10, and we're giving it a name. We're introducing this notation, logarithm base 3 of 10, simply means that number. If you plug this into a calculator, it's about 2.096. So 3 to that would be exactly equal to 10, but if you plugged in this decimal approximation, you would just be very close. So in general, y equals log base b of x this means the number to which b must be raised to produce x. So if I call that y, b to that number must equal x. And this is how we're going to very quickly go back and forth between exponential expressions and logarithms. If you have the exponential expression b to a power equals an output, then by definition that power is the log base b of the output. If, however, you start with a logarithm and you say log base b of an input x equals output y, by definition, that means that y, the logarithm of x, is an exponent on b, and this exponent would produce x, the number you plugged into your logarithm. They are inverse functions of one another. This is essentially the definition of what logarithms are. And we're going to use this relationship now to evaluate some specific logarithms exactly. So let's evaluate each of the following. So first, let's look at part A, log base 2 of 8. So suppose we declare y to be equal to log base 2 of 8. Let's convert this to an exponential expression. The base is here, the exponent is here, and the output is there. In other words, 2 to the y must equal 8. But 8 happens to be equal to 2 cubed. So now we have... 2 to 1 power equals 2 to another. But we've already remarked that exponential functions where the base is positive and not equal to 1, for example, here the base is 2, are 1 to 1. If you got out the same output, you must have started with the same input. So since 2 to the y equals 2 to the third, y must equal 3. So the logarithm base 2 of 8, which we've already called y, is exactly equal to 3. Moving on. For part b, let's declare y to be log base 5 of 1 over 25. Let's convert this to an exponential expression, so identify the base, the exponent, and the result. 5 to the y equals 1 over 25. Now, can I express 1 over 25 as an exponential expression with base 5? Yes, it's 5 to the negative 2 power. So 5 to the y equals 5 to the negative 2. Because exponential functions are 1 to 1, y must equal negative 2. So the logarithm base 5 of 1 over 25 is exactly equal to negative 2. Moving on, for part c, log base 2 of root 2, I'm going to call that y. Let's convert it to an exponential. 2 to the y equals root 2. Can we express that as an exponential of base 2? Absolutely. 2 to the y equals 2 to the 1 half, and therefore y equals 1 half. Remember that y is what we called log base 2 of root 2. So log base 2 of root 2 must be exactly equal to 1 half. And finally, Let's declare y to be the log base b of 1. So b to the y must equal 1. Now how on earth can we write 1 as an exponential expression of base b 
it's b to the zero. Remember, we don't know much about b here, but we know that it has to be a positive number because otherwise we wouldn't have invented this notation. So we have a positive number to the y equals one, therefore that exponent must be zero, meaning log base b of one must be equal to zero regardless of b, as long as b is a positive number and not equal to one. So this holds for any base, Provided the base is positive and not equal to one, those were the conditions for which the exponential function would be one to one and have an inverse. There are some cancellation properties here. Remember that the logarithm of base b was defined to be the inverse function of exponentiation with base b. So log base b of b to the x is always equal to x. So these two operations cancel in this composition. The composition of an exponential and a logarithm of the same base will cancel each other out. So we can use this to evaluate some logarithms. For example, let's evaluate each logarithm using this property. Log base three of 81, log base six of a sixth, log base seven of root seven. Starting from the beginning, log base three of 81. Well, we can write 81 as a power of three. 81 is three to the fourth. It's nine squared. Most people see that right away, but nine itself is three squared. So ultimately I'll end up with 81 equals three to the fourth. So here we have log base three of three to a power. Those cancel each other out and you just get out the power four. So logarithm base three of 81 is exactly equal to four. What about this log base six of one over six? We can write that as exponentiation with base six by calling it six to the minus one. And now the logarithm base six and the exponentiation base six cancel producing just the minus one. So log base six of one over six is exactly equal to negative one. Lastly, log base 7 of root 7. We're going to rewrite root 7 as 7 to the 1 half. This gives us a log base 7 of 7 to a power. They cancel out and we end up with exactly 1 half. Now let's talk about a special logarithm called the natural logarithm. Remember that we used e for the irrational number, which is about 2.72. This is the base for what we called the natural exponentiation function e to the x. We remarked that it's extremely useful in calculus. So if you undo this logarithm with its inverse and have the logarithm of base e, this is called the natural logarithm and it is denoted by ln of x. Please, please do not speak this aloud as a line of x because it's not a line, it's a logarithm. In other words, the natural log of x is simply the logarithm base e of x. So let's now consider e to the y is equal to 2. What is y? Now e is a positive number which is not equal to 1, so the exponential function e to the y has range all positive numbers. 2 is a positive number, so there is a number y so that e to the y is equal to 2. All we have to do is convert this exponential into its corresponding logarithm. Remember that one way of thinking of logs is what is the power to which the base must be raised to produce a given output. In other words, it is the logarithm base e of 2, which we write as the natural logarithm of 2. If you plug this into a calculator, you'll get out about 0.693. Log base 10 is also a special logarithm. It is used very often in scientific applications. If there is no subscript at all, if the base is not indicated, it is generally assumed that that means base 10. I'll make an aside here that I've mentioned in higher math for exponential functions, you almost always want to use the natural base e. Similarly, in higher math for logarithms, you almost always want to use the natural base e. So in other words, you always want to be using natural logs. So it's actually not uncommon in mathematics, like beyond the calculus level, for this expression log x with no base to actually mean the natural log because it's the only logarithm worth talking about past a certain point. However, in scientific and engineering applications, logarithm with no base indicated will almost always mean base 10 because base 10 is how we write our numbers. We have 10 digits and we write numbers in base 10. So scientifically, log base 10 is most common. So generally at this point in your mathematical lives, log of X with no base indicated will mean base 10. So log of X just means log base 10 of X. As an example, let's evaluate the logarithm of 1000. Incidentally, as ln of x is pronounced natural log, this is often called the common log. So let's evaluate the common log of 1000. So the common log of 1000 means the log base 10 
of a thousand, but a thousand is 10 to the third power. So now we have a logarithm of a given base composed with an exponential function of the same base. The logarithm and the exponential function cancel, leaving behind just that exponent of three. So the common log of a thousand is exactly equal to three. Now most calculators have keys for the natural logarithm, it'll be indicated as just ln, and the common logarithm, which will just be log. If you want to calculate a logarithm in another base, many calculators will actually give you a way to notate this, but it's not necessary to go through all that work. There's a straightforward conversion formula. The logarithm base b of x is the natural log of x over the natural log of b, and it's also equal to the common log of x over the common log of b. All of these are exactly the same. We're not going to go through a proof of this, we're just going to indicate how to use it. So for example, suppose we want to use log base 17 of 36.5 with a calculator, and let's suppose our calculator does not have a way to enter in other bases. You can only use natural log and common log. Now by the conversion formula above, the log base 17 of 36.5 is equal to the natural log of 36.5 divided by the natural log of 17. This will work out to be about 1.26969. You can check that's a reasonable answer. If you take 17 and raise it to that power, you'll get out something extraordinarily close to 36.5. So subject to some rounding errors in how the calculator displays the answer to you, this makes a lot of sense. So let's look at the graph of logarithmic functions. Now remember, if you have the graph of a function and you want to graph its inverse, you merely reflect the graph across the line y equals x. Inverse functions compared to the original functions swap the role of input versus output. In other words, you swap your x's and y's. You simply reflect across the line x equals y. So start with the line of y equals b to the x, and just to produce a picture, we're going to assume b is bigger than 1. If b was between 0 and 1, you'd have something very similar, but reflected, etc., etc., etc. As I said earlier, we're going to just consistently use b larger than 1 to produce our pictures. So here's what the graph would look like. It goes through the point 0, 1, it goes up to the right, it flattens out to the left. We're now going to obtain the graph of the logarithm base b of x by reflecting across the line y equals x. So here's the line y equals x, and now just imagine reflecting that curve across it, and you'll end up with this red curve here. So it goes down rather than flattening out, and where the graph went up, this red graph is sort of flattening out. Okay, so the reflected part of this horizontal asymptote now looks like a vertical asymptote, whereas this bit, which is going up faster and faster, now flattens out very much. And instead of going through the point 0, 1, it will go through the point 1, 0. We swap our x's and y's. So here's the graph of our log base b of x, where b is larger than 1. Now from the graph, we can describe some basic properties of logarithmic functions. So here was our graph of a logarithm base b of x where b was larger than 1. What are some basic properties of this function? The domain of this logarithm must be all positive numbers and not including 0. How do we know that? Well, from the graph we can see that we're only plugging in x's which are positive, but also the domain of this function will be the range of its inverse function. And remember that for exponential functions whose base is larger than 1, the range is all positive numbers. So the domain of a logarithm is all positive numbers. Note specifically, you cannot take the logarithm of 0. The log base b of 0 would be asking, to which power must I raise b to equal 0, and there is no such number. So you cannot take the logarithm of 0. You also can't take the logarithm of a negative number. Because b is a positive number, any power of it will still be positive. So there is no power to which you can raise b to produce a negative number. In other words, you cannot take the logarithm base b of a negative number. Now what is its range? The range is actually all real numbers because we know that's the domain of the exponential function. Remember that inverse functions compared to original functions swap domain and range. So since the range of the exponential was positive numbers, that's the domain of the logarithm, and the domain of the exponential is all numbers. So that's the range of the logarithm, and we see it from the graph. We see this going down and achieving negative numbers, but over here we're also going to get out positive values, positive heights of the logarithm function. It goes up pretty slowly, but it does keep going up. 
x equals zero is a vertical asymptote of this graph. It certainly is suggested by this picture, but it's also by definition. y equals zero was a horizontal asymptote of the exponential function, and we swap domain and range, we swap x's and y's. So instead of y equals zero as an asymptote, x equals zero as an asymptote, and that's a vertical line. So logarithmic functions have x equals zero as a vertical asymptote. Also, f of one is zero. In other words, the log base b of one is zero. We actually already saw that in an earlier example. b to the zero equals one, therefore log base b of one is zero. It's also an increasing function. If you look at this graph, as you move from left to right, the graph is always going up. So log base b of your input keeps getting bigger as your input gets bigger. Let's work through some examples. Find the domain of each of the following. The natural log of negative 4x plus 12, or the logarithm base 2, sometimes called the binary log, it's used a lot in computer science, of x squared plus 1. Okay, so as a solution, let's look at f of x equals natural log of negative 4x plus 12. What we need to do is set the thing inside the logarithm to be positive. The domain of logarithms in general is positive numbers. So what are we taking the logarithm of? We're taking the natural log of negative 4x plus 12. So negative 4x plus 12 had better be positive. Can we solve this for x? Absolutely. Subtract 12, divide by negative 4. Note that by dividing by a negative number, we must reverse the inequality. So the domain of this function is all x's less than 3. For part b, we have a logarithm of x squared plus 1. So we say the thing we're taking a logarithm of must be positive. But for any number x, x squared cannot be negative, so therefore x squared plus 1 will be at least as large as 1. It's definitely positive. So x squared plus 1 is always positive. Therefore, the domain of this function is actually all real numbers. The domain of the logarithm function in general is positive numbers, but we don't just have log of x. We have log base 2 of x squared plus 1, and that squaring plus a number really makes a big difference here. So the domain of this function here is all real numbers. No matter which x you pick, x squared plus 1 will definitely be positive, and the logarithm will therefore be defined. Now, exponential functions had a bunch of nice rules for working with them. Like, if you take a b and raise it to the x plus y, that will be the same as b to the x times b to the y. Similarly, b to the x to the y is the same thing as b to the x times y. There are properties of exponents. Now, because logarithms are inverse functions of exponents, there are similar rules, but they're kind of the opposites. So let's illustrate some of them with a calculator. Let's compute the common log of 8 plus the common log of 5. If you plug this into a calculator, you'll end up with a total of about 1.6. What about the natural log of 2 plus the natural log of 7? You'll end up with about 2.64. But if you also compute the common log of 40, you'll get exactly the same thing, 1.60206, and the natural log of 14, 2.63906. Now, what's the relationship between common log of 8 plus common log 5 versus common log 40? Natural log 2 plus natural log 7 and natural log 14. The general relationship is as follows. The logarithm of the product xy is equal to the logarithm of x plus the logarithm of y. What's very important is that all of these have the same base. But this corresponds to this right here. The exponential of a sum is equal to the product of the two exponentials. So you get a similar thing for logarithms, but it works a little different. The logarithm of the product is the sum of the two logarithms. So here is what we just mentioned. The logarithm base b of the product xy is equal to log base b of x plus log base b of y. There's a similar identity involving quotients rather than products. You just get the difference. The log base b of x over y equals log base b of x minus log base b of y. I would remark it is entirely possible and reasonable to prove these more formally. We're just not focusing on that here. We're introducing these, giving a brief explanation, and just using them. So finally, there's a useful identity related to logarithms of powers. Let's consider the logarithm base b of x squared versus the logarithm base b of x cubed. Now we're going to use the product identity above to try to understand this. Let's look first at log base b of x squared. x squared is simply x times x. So we're going to use this identity here, where instead of x times y, we have x times x. So we get an x here, but we're also going to get an x 
there. So we get log base b of x plus log base b of x. Now whatever log base b of x is, when I add it to itself, we get 2 times it. So the log base b of x squared is 2 times the log base b of x. What if we had x cubed? That would be the log base b of x times x times x. This identity involving logarithms of products can be used when you have more than two numbers multiplied. So you have x times x times x, that's a product of three numbers, so we're going to get a sum of three terms. But they're all going to be the log of x plus the log of x plus the log of x. Now a number added to itself three times is three times that number. So the log base b of x cubed is three times the log base b of x. Thinking through this procedure, you can convince yourself of a sort of general formula. The log base b of x to the n equals n times the log base b of x. And the argument we've given above works when n is a positive whole number, but the identity is actually true for any real number n. So the log base b of x to the n is always equal to n times the log base b of x, provided that both sides exist. In other words, x had better be a positive number for this logarithm here to be defined. So we can use these logarithmic identities to break a complicated looking logarithm into simpler looking pieces. For example, let's take a look at the natural log of x squared times x plus 1 cubed. We want to break this up into simpler looking logarithms just to the natural log of x and the natural log of x plus 1. So starting with this initial expression, we're first going to consider that we have inside our logarithm x squared times x plus 1 cubed, giving us a first natural logarithm of x squared plus the natural log of x plus 1 cubed. We've used this identity that a logarithm of a product can be broken apart as the sum of two logarithms. And here we're considering a to be x squared and b to be x plus 1 cubed. So the natural log of x squared times x plus 1 cubed is equal to the natural log of x squared plus the natural log of x plus 1 cubed. Now we have the natural log of x squared, which we can write as 2 times the natural log of x. And similarly, the natural log of x plus 1 cubed is 3 times the natural log of x plus 1. Now why is that? We've used this identity that the logarithm of something to a power, this power inside the logarithm can come out as a factor outside the logarithm. I would remark what's really important here is that the entire argument is being raised to the n. If, for example, we had x cubed plus 1, there would be nothing we can do. x cubed plus 1, the cube would only be on the x and you'd have a plus here. So you don't have a product overall because you have a plus one, and you don't have a power overall because you have a plus one. So what's important is that this entire expression x plus one is being cubed. Then you can bring this power out as a scalar factor of three. Another example, how would I write the natural log of root x plus one over x in terms of the same arguments natural log x and natural log x plus one? So first, the natural log of one thing over another, we have a quotient. So we're going to end up with the difference, the natural log of root x plus 1 minus natural log x. Here we're using that identity that the logarithm of a quotient is the difference of the two logarithms. And now we represent the square root of x plus 1 as x plus 1 to the power 1 half, because now we can see that that power of 1 half can come out as a factor, because the entire expression x plus 1 was being raised to a power. Another example. Write log base 3 of this nasty expression, fourth root of x over the product x plus 1 times x plus 2 squared. Write it in terms of log base 3x, log base 3x plus 1, and log base 3x plus 2. So as a solution, starting from here, we have a few things going on, but first, we have that quotient, fourth root of x over a whole bunch of stuff. So break that apart as the log base 3 of the fourth root of x minus the log base 3 of that entire denominator. Now that denominator is a logarithm base 3 of a product, x plus 1 times x plus 2 squared. So you might write log base 3 x plus 1 plus log base 3 x plus 2 squared. This would be a very common error. You need to put brackets or parentheses around this entire expression because this minus sign is applied to this entire thing. So this breaks down as this sum, and now you need to distribute the minus sign across the whole thing. What else can we do here? Well, our first term is log base 3 of x to the 1 fourth, so we can write that as 1 fourth times the log base 3 of x. And finally, if we distribute the minus sign across that bracket, now we have a bunch of terms, just log base 3x, log base 3x plus 1, and log base 3x plus 2.
we can, if desired, essentially do the reverse. We can take a bunch of simple looking logarithms and combine them into one more complicated looking logarithm. In the following examples, as in the previous one, what was terribly important is that all the logarithms have to have the same base. So let's write this as a single logarithm, the common log of 100 minus common log 5 minus common log 2. So we end up with this string of terms, but they all have the same base. They all have base 10. So first we can write the log of 100 minus log 5 as the log of the quotient 100 over 5. And we haven't dealt with this minus log 2 yet. But that's just using the identity that the log of one number minus the log of another is the log of a quotient. So we haven't dealt with this minus log 2. It's hanging off by itself. But this difference we're expressing as the log of this quotient. 100 over 5 is just 20, but now again we have one logarithm minus another. So we can write that as the log of the quotient, and 20 over 2 is just 10. Hey, what's the common log of 10? Well, remember, this is the base 10. So logarithm base b of b will always equal 1. Remember, by definition, this is asking, what is the exponent I need to raise the base to to get the output 10? But the base here is 10. This is the common log. So this is asking, what is the exponent on 10 to get out 10? Well, the exponent would be 1. In general, this is saying, what is the exponent on the base b to get out b? Well, the exponent on b should be 1. Logarithm base b of b is always equal to 1. Two more examples. Let's write these as a single logarithm. Okay, so first looking up top, we have 2 log x minus 1 half log x minus 4. These are common logs. The base is 10. The base itself isn't terribly important. What's important is that the terms have the same base. So first let's look at what we have. We have a 2 times a logarithm and a 1 half times a logarithm. So let's bring those factors inside the logarithm as powers. So 2 log x is the same as log of x squared. And 1 half log of x minus 4 is the same thing as log of x minus 4 to the 1 half. And now we have a difference of two logarithms, so we can write that as a quotient. So ultimately we end up with a single logarithm, the common log of x squared over x minus 4 to the 1 half power. For the second one, we have 5 natural log a plus natural log b minus 1 third natural log a plus b. These all have the same base, the natural base e. But first, let's get all of these terms to just be natural logs with no scalar multiples multiplying them out to the left. So for our first term, instead of 5 times the natural log of a, we want the natural log of one single thing. That would be a to the fifth. Our second term natural log of b is fine. Leave it how it is. And for our third term, we have one third times the natural log of a plus b. How do we make this just a natural log with no factor? Call it the natural log of a plus b to the one third. Now I have three things that are all natural logs, not being multiplied by anything. So those first two terms, a to the fifth and natural log of b, I can call the natural log of a to the fifth times b. Now we'll deal with this last term, and now we have one natural log minus another natural log. We can call that the natural log of the quotient. So using all of our various properties of natural logs, we've combined this into a single logarithm, the natural log of a to the fifth times b over a plus b to the one third. Now in all of the previous examples, what was very important is that we were working with the same base across multiple terms. But we have the change of base formula that allows us to take a logarithm in one base and change it to another base somehow. Therefore, we can combine logarithms of different bases by using this change of base formula. So let's write this as a single logarithm. We have the log base 2 of x plus 1 plus the log base 3 of x plus 1. The first thing we want to do is pick a single base to use for all of our logarithms. And there's no correct choice here, but by default, we'll generally go with the natural base. So we're going to convert both of these logarithms to natural logarithms. So first up, the log base 2 of x plus 1, we can replace with the natural log of x plus 1 divided by natural log of 2. And the log base 3 of x plus 1, we have the natural log of x plus 1 over the natural log of 3. Now this may look very different from things we've had before. However, our variable x only occurs here and here. The natural log of 2 and the natural log of 3 are just numbers. Okay, I could plug them into a calculator and get decimal approximations, but I don't particularly want to. What we have is a number times the natural log of x plus 1, where that number is 1 over natural log 2. 
and then 1 over natural log 3 times the natural log of x plus 1. So since natural log 2 and natural log 3 are just numbers, we can factor this out. So finding a common factor of natural log x plus 1 across the two terms and factoring it out, what's left behind are 1 over log 2 plus 1 over natural log 3, and that's just a number. So now we have a number times the natural log of x plus 1 which we can bring in as a power. Remember that a number times a logarithm can be expressed as a logarithm of the input to that power. So this is just a number, one over natural log two plus one over natural log three. So I have a number times the natural log of an expression with a variable. So I can call that the natural log of that expression raised to this power. So it is possible to do the same sorts of steps combining logarithms when the bases are different as long as you incorporate the change of base formula and get comfortable writing expressions like 1 over natural log 2 and recognizing that that is just a number.